Our meditation today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter chapter 15, verses 42 through 47. Mark 15, 42 through 47. We'll begin our prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's take a minute of silence. Just enter into the presence of the Lord. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the gift of lives. Thank you for Jesus' life. Lord, as we enter into this meditation, I turn myself over to you. Lord, I give you my life, beginning with giving you my day. Lord, I give you my morning. <clears throat> my rising, my waking, my coffee, my morning prayer, the work that I had to do, the people I saw, conversations I had. Lord, I put them into your hands. Lord, I give you my mid-morning Same thing, all the conversations, all my work, food I ate. Thank you for all of it, Lord. Give him my mid my midday. <clears throat> uh, driving that I did. My time with other priests. All the things we spoke about and that I received. Sacrament of Reconciliation. Lord, I thank you for all that and I give give it to you and put it in your hands. Lord, I give you my afternoon. In my work, my tasks, my worries, my anxieties, <clears throat> the things that are still going to be waiting me for me when I get done with this. Lord, in this moment, I can't do anything about it, but you can. So, Lord, please take those things and do whatever you want with them. Lord, I give you my evening that's coming up. I give you the work that awaits me, the prayer that I will do, my dinner, my rest, my going to sleep. Lord, please, please use it for your greater glory. Lord, I believe in you. Help me to believe. Lord, I hope in you. Help me to hope. Lord, I love you. Help me to love. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. Come, Holy Spirit. In this time, in this moment of reading the scriptures, I ask that you make Jesus present to me, that you show me the presence of Jesus in these scriptures in whatever way you want for me right now. 
if there is a way that you want that for me right now, Lord. Lord, I give you permission to use this time in whatever way you want, and I invite you to uh, to share with me your heart, whatever you have going on. And so, Lord, send your Spirit upon me. Come, Holy Spirit. Come and help me. When it was already evening, since it was the day of preparation, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a distinguished member of the council who was himself awaiting the kingdom of God, came and courageously went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was amazed that he was already dead. He summoned the centurion and asked him if Jesus had already died. And when he learned of it from the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. Having brought a linen cloth, he took him down, wrapped him in the linen cloth, and laid him in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone against the rock, then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, watched where he was laid. So I read through this again, composing the scene in my mind. When it was already evening, since it was the day of preparation, the day before the Sabbath, in other words, it's Friday, Joseph of Arimathea, distinguished member of the council, who was himself awaiting the kingdom of God, a distinguished member of the council, so Joseph of Arimathea, probably somewhat of a wealthy, powerful man, you would imagine. Member of the council, <laughs> I'm not sure if it's speaking of the Sanhedrin here specifically or not, but you can imagine that He was probably present in the condemnation of Jesus. He was probably in the room, I would think. And all of the Sanhedrin, the scribes, the chief priests, all got together to condemn Jesus. You'd imagine that Joseph would have been there. And seen him condemned. And seen what was going to happen. says, he came and courageously went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. He courageously went to Pilate. It took courage to go to Pilate in this circumstance. That's interesting. So what was Joseph feeling? Were the other Jews judging him for following Jesus? Was he courageous because of who Jesus was, or was he courageous for going and asking Pilate for him or for both? Just try to imagine sort of the scene and the, uh, the feeling in the room. Was there a frigidity? Was there a tenseness? Is that what made this a courageous act? Everyone else would have been scared to do it. Was there a sense of fear hanging over everything? What's the feeling in the room when he goes and he asks Pilate? What's it look like when he walks through the doors? Does he have to talk to the guards, explain to the guards why he's there? Do the guards have to show him in and tell Pilate why he's there? Pilate was amazed that he was already dead. Pilate was amazed that he had died before evening.
I don't imagine it's possible that some people probably hung on the cross for more than a day before they died. Maybe many people did. Otherwise, how could Pilate be amazed that he'd already died? That just after six hours, Jesus' death came very quick. And a look at Pilate hearing that Jesus had died. His first response isn't to speak to Joseph. It's like, what? He's already dead? And then perhaps he's worried that Joseph is trying to pull something on him, so he confirms with the centurion. You can see him motioning over the centurion, maybe yelling at him, telling him to come over, or sending someone after him, sending an attendant to go and bring the centurion into his presence. Maybe the centurion was a long ways away. Maybe the centurion was still there at the foot of the cross. So maybe it took 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes for a messenger to go out and centurion to come back. Maybe they made Joseph wait off to the side while Pilate did other business in the meantime, because after all, dealing with Jesus was just one of the things that he had to do that day. No doubt he had other people coming to him, asking him for things. Condemnation and the death of Jesus is all in the day of the life of a Roman governor. Just another... Another thing to tick off on the list. Jesus' unimportance to everyone just marvels me. It's I find it astonishing. He summoned the centurion and asked him if Jesus already died. When he learned of it from the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. So I assume that means he he simply gave permission. And since Pilate owned Jesus' body, he gave the body to Joseph. It's like Pilate owned the body. Jesus' body was owned by the Romans. But then Joseph, having brought a linen cloth, he took him down, wrapped him in the linen cloth, and laid him in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. So I see but Jesus' dead body hanging on the cross. I see Joseph laying out the linen cloth, probably with, I would think, with somebody else. Joseph in his fine, rich garments. Maybe having to set some of those aside as he laid the cloth under the foot of the cross. And then how do you take a man off of a cross? Do you hammer the nails back out from the other way? Do you hammer the nails through? Can't imagine they had anything that could cut the nails. If the nails had been bent in the back, then they would have had to hammer the the nails back into a straight shape so that they could be pulled out. Probably hammered out. Got to imagine it would take quite a bit of time. depending on how many people are helping, trying to bring Jesus' dead, lifeless body down off the cross. So the first point of meditation is just to continue with this scene. What does it look like to take Jesus' dead body down from the cross? What does it look like for Joseph to do that? 
I imagine myself just kind of standing off to the side. Just kind of standing, looking at the rocky ground. Evening's coming on. Feel a cold breeze. See clouds in the sky. Sun's still out, but it's going down. Joseph is working. Hit by hit, he hammers the nails into shape so that they can be hammered out of the of Jesus' flesh. There's got to be a lot of blood on them. Wonder if there's any rope involved. Are his arms tied up with a rope? Imagine him having to. If that's there to cut the knot. To undo the knot and to unwrap everything. Also, no doubt, stained with blood. Body's dead and lifeless. Imagine you probably want to take the nails out of the feet first. Once you take the nails out of the feet, trying to take one arm free one arm but you'd want somebody there who could hold Jesus up once the restraints are done once they're taken off so that the body doesn't just fall straight in headlong into the ground I'm just all the work just trying to just trying to get Jesus down from the cross. Take some serious time. In the meantime, the risk of uh, the linen cloth getting all dirty, potentially from dust blowing over it or people shuffling their feet and Shuffling dirt up onto it, maybe. Trying to put it in a smooth place on the ground. It's not rocky so that they can effectively wrap Jesus up in it. It's a large cloth. Shroud. Able to cover his body entirely. How much time does this take? Five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour? I doubt Joseph had experience taking men off the cross. Who knows, perhaps he didn't really have much experience with dead bodies even. Or maybe he did. Maybe he'd have family members who had died and have had had, had to bury them before. Maybe that's why he had everything arranged for his own tomb and his own death.
When it was already evening, since it was the day of preparation, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a distinguished member of the council, who was himself awaiting the kingdom of God, came and courageously went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was amazed that he was already dead. He summoned the centurion and asked him if Jesus had already died. I wonder if they spoke in Latin, if they spoke in Greek, or if they spoke in some other language. And when he learned of it from the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. Having brought, having bought a linen cloth, he took him down, wrapped him in the linen cloth, and laid him in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance to the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, watched where he was laid. So Mary Magdalene and Mary, mother of Joseph, know Joseph of Arimathea. I don't know. Second point of meditation, Jesus being buried in the tomb. What was it like carrying Jesus to the tomb? Again, did Joseph have help? Did he carry him over his own shoulder by himself? Did he have a couple of people? One at each end, or maybe both of them carrying, carrying Jesus on his shoulder? Was there blood that seeped through the linen? Or had all of the blood all coagulated and dried up already? Some of that blood had been on Jesus for a long time that day. Think of Jesus just getting carried from the cross to the tomb. There's something just... Uh, I don't know what the word is. Ignomious? Something... Almost undignified about it, it seems like. Just thinking about Jesus' dead body getting carried around on people's shoulders or... However it is they got in there, but... And yet it's essential. You can't do anything else. What are you supposed to do? Again, Jesus is just getting buried like an ordinary person, not like anyone special. So they carry him to a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock and then rolled a stone against the entrance to the tomb. I know what that looks like in the movies. A big hollow tomb. The big bed space. It's the image of my mind. I feel like some of the tombs you think of in the movies with Jesus could hold a dozen people. What if it was much smaller? What if it was just a little tiny crash, just big enough for a body? Or maybe it was big. Or maybe there was just room for a couple of people. Or there was maybe it was big could hold a dozen people standing up. Was the the stone a big round stone shaped like a wheel? Or was it some sort of awkward shape? Something more difficult and unwieldy than that. Imagine if it's got to be heavy enough to keep things and people out of it generally I 
It would have to be in a shape that means it could get rolled. But rocks are heavy. What's the biggest rock that you can roll? Maybe it was a big wheel. I don't know how else rolling a large rock would be possible. One that's large enough for even a small entrance. I can't think of how you could have a doorway sized entrance to a tomb and be able to roll a rock there without a massive amount of help. But it says then he rolled a stone against the entrance to the tomb. What if it was just a small kind of cubby hole sized entrance? Even if the tomb itself was large. What if it was just a very narrow doorway? Something like the quarter, a quarter of the, of a normal door size or even smaller than that. Something just big enough to fit your head and shoulders through. Even though the inside of the rock is. It's clear, you can fit people in it. When it was already evening, since it was the day of preparation, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a distinguished member of the council who was himself awaiting the kingdom of God, came and courageously went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was amazed that he was already dead. He summoned the centurion and asked him if Jesus had already died. And when he learned of it from the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. Having bought a linen cloth, he took him down, wrapped him in the linen cloth, and laid him in the tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance to the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, watched where he was laid. I think of just what it must have been like, that feeling. Third point of meditation is the absence of Jesus. Just his life is just gone. For all the disciples, the apostles, the women, everyone. Well, Jesus is gone. He was there hours before. And then in a twist and shock, he was crucified. And then he died and suddenly he's buried. A day before, they were all looking forward to the great things Jesus would do, and now he's dead. He's dead and gone and buried. I just can't even imagine the level of despair that would tempt me to. It just seems like it would feel like your whole life was a lie. You left everything to follow this man. You provided for him. You gave him money. You gave him food. You gave him shelter. You gave him all these other things for him and his followers. You believed in him. He was going to do good things. And then he's dead. You know, if you believed he was God, maybe you believed he was invincible. Maybe you believed that he couldn't be hurt that he would found the kingdom of God. You believe he was going to start a kingdom, that he was going to be king, and you were convinced of it and you believed it because you'd seen his miracles, you'd seen his works. 
You couldn't imagine that any wound could keep him down. And then he's dead. Just dead and gone. Lord, I feel like this is the scandal of this part of the scandal of the mystery of your incarnation. There's something so strange, so bizarre about the reality that you, eternal God, could die. That you became so human, that you could even become that human. Seems like there would have had to have been some separation, something different, something that would keep you from dying, something that would make you immortal. You just died like any other human. You were gone. And the disciples were no doubt in great fear. Not only sad that you were lost and upset about that, but also fear of retaliation, fear that now that you were gone, now the rest of them could be hunted down like criminals as well, looked down upon or disdained or everything that they believed had been proven false. They had no protection. They had no defenses. You were supposed to be that person for them. You were supposed to be there for them and provide for them. You were supposed to lead them and give them everything they needed. And then suddenly you're not there and you can't even do any of it. Even if they both heard your words, even if any of the apostles heard your words and believed in the resurrection, how many of them doubted and just thought, but what if it doesn't happen? What if it's not true? What if it doesn't come to fruition? Lord, I know that when I don't feel your presence, that's what I'm tempted towards doubt. When I don't see you acting in my life, I can sometimes start to panic and worry that you're not there. Even though I know it in my head, even though I believe it, I don't always feel it in my heart. But I guess that's part of being in this world of death. This world that's passing away. We don't experience the full power of your salvation in this life. And we often try to turn it into worldly terms and believe that your salvation is for just our life in this world rather than for the kingdom that is to come. Lord, I still look for you to create your kingdom here on earth instead of living for your kingdom that is not of this earth. Sometimes. Still sometimes in my life, Lord, I look for success rather than faithfulness to you. Lord, sometimes I look to just build things up and I forget that in the greatest work that you accomplished, in your greatest act of love, you gave yourself so fully that the disciples felt the absence of your presence and the apostles felt a, perhaps even abandoned by you. I hope and I pray there were some that still kept full faith. 
They may have been hurt by this, but didn't, uh, maybe all of them, maybe most of them, I should say. Maybe they knew and believed that they'd followed you so long that they had confidence and thought to themselves, I don't understand, but there's meaning in this, that something good will happen. Maybe those, those who believed fully in the resurrection. I don't know. Maybe they all felt like that. I don't know. Lord, I just ask for the grace to have the confidence in you of trusting and believing that you're with me even in those times when I don't feel you. Given how often I've seen your work and your miracles in my own life. Lord, help me to remember those when, when I don't feel you or sense you or see you. Lord, help me to believe that you are always in control, that your plan is working. That you are doing things according to your will. After all, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. World without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.